This is our final uh, part of the convocation panel discussion of all of our speakers and uh, workshop leaders. I wel welcome you again for this uh, piece of the convocation and welcome again and thank our speakers, our panel, um, Dr. Norma Cook Everest, Dr. Richard Osmer, Dr. Margaret Crick, and soon to be Dr. Jessica Duckworth. Now I turn it over to Margaret Crick to uh, get the panel discussion started. There will be time for you to ask questions, of course. And uh, as with yesterday, I'll try to run around the room with a microphone so you can be heard by everyone. Dr. Crick. Thanks very much, Craig. Welcome to this morning's panel. And let me thank sincerely the Executive Committee of the Alumni Board and the Planning Committee for this convocation because I believe it's a gift that will really enrich the ministries of everybody who attended. Our panel this morning, we're glad to welcome back Dr. Richard Osmer, Professor of Education and Formation at Princeton Theological Seminary and Dr. Norma Cook Everest, Professor of Church and Ministry at Wartburg Theological Seminary and Professor Jessica Duckworth, Associate Professor of Christian Formation and Teaching at Wesley Theological Seminary. And I'd like to thank Dr. Osma and Dr. Everest for their wonderful lectures yesterday and all three panelists for their very fine workshops. I've heard wonderful things about the two workshops that I wasn't at and I can assure you that the one I was at was wonderful too. So. Thank you to everybody. The organizers of the event suggested that I open uh, with a short synopsis of where <laughs> Christian education has come in the last 20 years or so and what I would see the future looking like and then each of the panelists is going to give briefly their views of Christian education looking into the future and then we will open it up for questions from you. 20 years ago, we had emerged from a situation that might have been somewhat problematic in terms of preparing persons for education and mission. There was an emphasis on the scriptures in the 1950s and 60s, but after that, we went through a period where we offered courses on the basis of participants' choice of topics, a la Malcolm Knowles and Leon McKenzie, a choice that did not necessarily deal with serious biblical and theological learning. And then in the 70s and early 80s, we moved, and I can only speak for Lutheranism here, through imagination and the arts and sociological issues and a social science approach to religious education and liberation education and faith education and life transition learning and cooperative service learning. And they all had their good points, but they did not necessarily push people to think theologically or biblically or ask themselves how to articulate what God had done in their lives. But there were voices in the late 70s, 80s, and especially early 90s, I want to mention. Uh, people like Sarah Little and Walter Brueggemann and Olivia Pearl Stokes and Lawrence Richards who were saying it's very important for the people of God to thoroughly learn what they believe. In 1990, the clearest and strongest voice was that of Dr. Rick Osmer on our panel today in his book, A Teachable Spirit, which was a real landmark in calling the church to recover its teaching authority and to engage in the task of determining the church's normative beliefs and practices. And Lutherans said, yay, we've got our confessions. Yeah. Interpreting those beliefs and practices in the light of shifting cultural and historical contexts, and that's very relevant for our topic here, and Lutherans did far worse on that one, and forming educational institutions, processes, and curricula by which the normative beliefs and practices are taught. In the endeavor, he called for a cooperative effort of seminaries, national staffs, congregations, and pastors. I still thank God for that book, and I remember, and probably you were there, I think, Norma, the meeting of the Lutheran Christian education professors we had with national staff people and the Board of Publication, or members from the staff of, of uh, the publishing house, to discuss the book and ask how we could actually talk together and cooperate 
in the teaching task of the church. And, uh, and, and those were very useful uh, discussions. In the predecessor bodies of the ELCA, there were a couple of efforts to do some really good biblical work with a lot of persons in the denominations of the church bodies. One of them was Word and Witness, which many of you fondly remember, and which was written by Professor Jack Ruman and Professor Foster McCurley of this seminary's faculty. And thousands and thousands, I forget how many, but it was huge, uh, persons studied the scriptures. Now, while it was called Word and Witness, about two-thirds of the thousands of persons studying actually did the Bible part, but without the witness part. <laughs> so we didn't get very far in articulating what God had done in our lives, but we did become more biblically literate. And following that came a call for relating theology to the daily life and vocation of Christian adults. And of course, the Connection series, co-written by Dr. Everest, was the major move in that direction. But as Dr. Osmo pointed out yesterday, our context has changed. No longer can we assume that all our teaching and learning can assume active baptized persons. And when I look at what's happening, particularly in ELCA congregations, I see between nine and 10,000 of you that have active Sunday schools, several, uh, 7,900 7, and something or other that have vacation Bible schools and so on. So there is an att a strong attempt to reach the children, the active baptized, I call them, mm -hmm. uh, in the, the preschool and the elementary years. But as the recent study showed, that doesn't necessarily translate into emerging adults who know the faith. I also see some very strong work everywhere on the part of catechetics. And that, of course, is, is part of our Lutheran heritage and always will be. And I see gradually, I think very usefully, congregations moving to later age levels, uh, grades 8, 9, and sometimes now grade 10. And that is also very helpful, but again, usually geared to what I would call the active baptized. Now, during those catechetical years, often teenagers that have nothing to do with the church come along. Have you noticed that somebody was mentioning that yesterday, uh, as I recall, either in the major plenary or, or in our uh, workshop, I can't remember which. That is the phenomenon that often happens. But sometimes the teaching does not take account of the fact that these Teenagers are turning up with virtually no background at all, and yet often stay right through and become baptized at the same service that the other persons who have been <coughs> active baptized uh, are confirmed or have the affirmation of baptism service. But the adult education, oh yes. The adult education is something else, dear friends. <coughs> And it seems to me that this is one of the big challenges for the future. We were reminded yesterday that education and mission go together. And 50 years ago, Paul Tillich argued they were the same task, passing on the Christian faith to the next generation or to those who had fallen away from the church or to those who'd never heard. Same thing, done in different ways. And even then, he had the insight to say that one of the things that must be done, first of all, is to know what you believe. The second is to participate, to understand the language and the situation, the context of the persons that, that you hope will learn with you in the faith. And those persons are increasingly not the active baptized. So we have a race that knows not Joseph, if you like, wouldn't even know Joseph if they tripped over him. They don't know the language of the scriptures or the language of theology. In St. Matthew's Lutheran Church, uh, where my husband served until his retirement, we had a great desire 
that persons would share the faith with others. And what they said was, I don't think I know enough. Or I'd be scared if someone asked me a question. I won't know how to answer that. What would happen if I looked stupid? What they wanted, needed, and, and was immediately set in motion were a lot of options, not just one. Dr. Everest mentioned this yesterday. You can't just have one adult class. That's, mm. People like choices. People like different times. They're working adults. They're all working adults mm. nowadays. They need different topics. They need different leaders. They need different teachers. They want choices. And they needed choices to help them think about the faith and seriously learn about it. Once they had done that, person after person said, now I think I honestly could talk about what God's doing in my life. And I feel comfortable enough that if somebody asks a question to which I do not have the answer, I won't feel stupid. I'll just say, yeah, I can find that out and get back to you. That is a sea change. And that is a very important part of what is going to be necessary if education and mission are going together. Actually, 10 days ago, uh, on Sunday, I talked with a person of the current congregation I'm at who had just taken a course, his first course, at this seminary. He hasn't even finished it. He came rushing up to tell me what a wonderful thing had happened to him. And he said, I sort of think, I sort of think I, that doesn't sound good, I sort of knew uh, what I believed. More or less, it, it was apprehended, but not really comprehended. I had no words to put it in. This course has given me the words to put it in. And I am going to teach this congregation. I am going to have all sorts of learning here. I am going. He was just excited. I think excitement is something that also is required. People in the early church were excited. They wanted to share about Jesus and what Jesus had done in their lives. Excitement and enough understanding of what they believe and some words to put it in and some practice in doing that could make an enormous difference in what's happening in adult education, at least in the Lutheran church. Adults still need to hear the good news of the gospel. They still need to be educated in what it means to be one of the priesthood of all believers. They still need to deal with issues in daily life and vocation. But they also need to practice talking, first perhaps to one another, and then to their neighbors and everyone with whom they come into contact. Why don't they do it? Probably because in everyday life, you know how to talk about what Aunt Susie has done in your life. Because everybody talks about their own Aunt Susie. And you see it modeled. You don't see modeled well what it means to let people know about God and what God has done for you. And if you don't see it modeled and you don't practice it, then you're very hesitant to try to do it. I think we need a lot more training of persons to lead adults and teach adults. The pastor cannot do it alone. In the ELCA, the Constitution says that the pastor is responsible for confirmation. That doesn't mean catechetics. That means all of the education and pastoral ministry from the point of baptism right through into young adulthood and on into further adulthood. Emerging adulthood and adults who've emerged. Well, yes, anyway. That's huge. It doesn't mean you, if you're a pastor, that you have to do the whole lot, or if you're a DCE, that you have to do the whole lot. It means you have to make sure that it's done and done well. And that's not a choice. It's in the Constitution. It's a requirement of all pastors of the ELCA. We are going to have this opportunity to study the Book of Faith, the Book of Faith Initiative, coming out this year. 
but I hope that it's not going to end up being just a Bible study for the active baptized. We'll have thousands and thousands of people doing it, just as we did with Word and Witness. But don't let it just stay at Word. We need to discuss this and talk about the scriptures in ways that will help us communicate to the world around us. And if it doesn't do that, then, then it's just the tip of the iceberg, maybe a helpful personal tip, but not at all going to help the issue of missional education. So I'm praying that uh, that, that initiative is going to be a possible opening for some of the things that we've been talking about here. Margaret, I'm so glad we're able to hear from you this morning because uh, she has so much to share. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you for the privilege of being here. I came, as many of you have been through this flu season, having come off a hard battle with the flu, and on the way out on the airplane, I kept getting weaker and weaker and weaker and becoming dehydrated and to the point that I didn't think I could stand up here yesterday morning and lecture. But my dear husband said, one foot ahead of the other. So uh, I am here, and yes, with my uh, vitamin water. I understand yesterday at the table that one of the tables was kind of taking bets on uh, when my water glass would run out, and then I pulled out my mug with more. <laughs> <coughs> so I have a whole couple of jars up here this morning. <coughs> what a privilege, really. I'm not just being nice here, about to be with these four people. Who I just, um, I respect these three people so much. And we don't get together a lot. Um, often at these kind of panels on the last day of a convocation, I come with a little bit of my defenses up because it will have been one theologian against another theologian and put up your idea and I'll see if I can shoot it down with my missile, you know, that kind of, that kind of methodology. And let's see if we can entrap them in a debate. That kind of methodology, which is dumb. <laughs> but the kind of collaborative learning, of learning from one another, that I know all these people share. I came just with utter joy this morning. We don't have to have a Christian education that is a battlefield, but is life-giving mm. learning from one another. And, and if I may, I mean, the connections we have, Margaret and I, yes, have been friends so long, and it was kind of fun last night to be with the first woman tenured in the LCA and the first woman tenured in the ALC to be together, but we've been friends all these years. And then Margaret, of course, is the teacher of Jessica, and Jessica is the student of, of Rick, right, <laughs> just finishing her PhD mm -hmm. and getting mm -hmm. the responses back. And we were? We were, we were graduates, classmates at Yale Divinity School, graduated the same year 32 years ago. And I don't think I've seen each other since. Once. Once. Yeah. So this is, <laughs> this is really fun. This is really fun. But just a, a few uh, remarks. Uh, yes, indeed, Margaret, we've been through, I remember the 70s kind of the, predicting the death of the Sunday school. Well, it didn't die. And then catechetics, oh, that's old. Well, lifelong catechesis is what we're all about these days. Um, I am so pleased that at Wartburg Seminary and many of our seminaries, at least one course, educational ministry in our case, is required of all students. Because we, and my goal is that every graduate will come forth thinking of themselves as, as teachers of the faith and teachers of teachers and be excited about that task. Um, at, we realize that often candidacy committees and uh, approval essays and so on are about how you preach. Right? But the idea of teaching the faith and being teaching theologians, is uh, it excites me, and my goal is that everyone will come forth from a seminary being excited about that task. Um, the very fact that this seminary uh, here in Philadelphia is deeply rooted, as the president said last night, deeply rooted and open ecumenically and interfaith, and that's where we need to be in every congregation. We need to, uh, whether Presbyterian, Lutheran, Methodist, whatever, deeply rooted in our Christian convictions and open, we, we've been saying this for years with doors wide open, but really mean it this time, 
so that we're teachers in the public world because I fully believe the world is hungering to make sense. Or if you will, mm -hmm. the intersection of Luther's what does this mean of the catechism with what in the world does this mean of daily life? To, to teach at that intersection. Um, the um, uh, future, I believe, is has been as, as old as the Reformation of doing theology, speaking the faith, reading the scriptures in the vernacular. In our workshop yesterday afternoon, we dealt with that. In the sense of, of yes, now, and this book of faith, open the scriptures, join the conversation initiative is a way for us to, to grow in competence and confidence and, and, uh, uh, and at the same time for us to be able to begin where we are in the issues of daily life. In our workshop yesterday afternoon, we talked about the languages that people speak and faith put all of them on the, on the board for us. Uh, do you speak business? Do you speak, uh, one said, retirement language? Do I speak, what, what languages do people speak all day long? And to begin there, to begin there, so that people can already talk their talk and we can listen into their languages and talk about this shared faith in the vernacular. Uh, people have all sorts of questions. Um, why not begin with the questions? Yes, we need to begin with my story of faith, but what about your story? Or what about the, well, the ideas we can't even put into story yet, but that we live each day? Uh, just, just briefly, because it was on the news this morning again, uh, but in a new way that Barack Obama has now uh, denounced uh, the words and the messages of Jeremiah Wright as pastor. That raises all sorts of questions. And I realize that Jeremiah Wright grew up here in, in G Germantown. Um, but the questions are deeper than that. In, in, in Iowa, in the political scene, uh, one of the, the candidates came, had us invited neighborhoods to talk about faith and daily life. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Actually, it was the Obama campaign. They had leaders around, not talking about the candidates so much, but inviting people in dialogue we had one of those at Wartburg Seminary, and all the neighbors came, and they had his small groups talking about, you know, what do you, what's really concerning you in your life? Mm. What are your questions? Mm. And what is your faith? Mm. What? <laughs> and, and so neighbors came in. We talked in small groups, and, and they started asking our seminary students what their faith was. Mm. It was wonderful. <laughs> the public world coming into the seminary with the questions about faith and daily life. Um, I teach leadership in church administration as well as education. And in the leaders in mission class that I've been part of this, uh, this spring, as usual, I talked about the leadership of a faith congregation, the leadership, what is the role, we say, of pastors, leaders in their community, right? In an ecumenical interfaith community. And also, what is the role of leaders of the parishioners who carry out their vocation in daily life. And we don't usually think of our leadership in that way. You know, we think of leadership within the congregation. But what's our leadership of all the people who go out from our congregations and on Tuesday afternoon, Thursday morning, are encountering all sorts of questions? Well, lo and behold, that's the question that's in the news this morning. What's the relationship of Jeremiah Wright with one of his parishioners who's carrying out his vocation in the public world, just happens to be running for president. We'll multiply that with all the people in the parishes where we live and work. What is the relationship? All sorts of questions about daily life and vocation and the world and, and, and the economy and, and, and the war. That people, and, and how can my family make it through the end of the week? All those questions are already inside the people among whom we are privileged to serve, waiting to be asked and to be in dialogue around scripture and the articles of the faith. Oh, there's nothing boring about Christian education. Mm -hmm. Beginning where people are. Um, and that future is always going to be with us. Thank you. 
I am so grateful to be here, as all of you know. <laughs> I've shared many times. And I thought I'd just highlight a couple of things um, in relation to my gratitude and indebtedness to Dr. Crick and her ministry and witness here. The first is what she has already said, which is our ministry of equipping. And I find that I learned so much here about the role of every congregational leader within educational ministry, teaching and learning ministries in our congregation, whether it is the pastor, the associate ministry, the director of Christian education, or any congregational leader, that our ministry is not that only of doing, but it is the ministry of equipping and equipping others to do the leading and the teaching and the learning in the congregation. And I find that that was no more uh, clear to me in many of our assignments in Christian education courses here at LTSP, in which we actually had to engage curriculum, the real stuff in books. And it is no wonder to me that Dr. Crick has served so faithfully on the board of Augsburg Fortress for so many years to actually produce good quality curriculum. And it's curriculum that is not going to serve all of our purposes in the wide, diverse arrangements and leadership styles and multiple contexts that the ELCA is across this United States. And yet, it is incumbent upon all of us to take curriculum and appropriate it to the context in which we are in. Why is curriculum so important, and why have I learned to appreciate that from Dr. Crick? And that's because if we do not provide resources of the faith, we are not going to be able to <coughs> equip those within our congregations who do not have the time to necessarily set aside time to come to seminary. And so these are concrete resources that are in the hands of people who are desperate to want to lead and facilitate adult, youth, and children learning in our congregations. And so that's my deep gratitude to the respect of curriculum and to the task that is so hard of producing curriculum. And already, as you said, the call to remember that the Book of Faith is not going to be the solution to all of our congregations. You have the hard work ahead of you of integrating word and witness, the Bible and our mission, and hold them in tandem in you, in your embodied beings in your congregation, to be passionate about the word and passionate about the witness that we do have as Lutherans and that we have as all Christians, whether they're active or inactive, coming into our congregations who are desperate to know and make meaning about the faith and about who Jesus is for our life today. I want to hear a lot more, so I'm going to pass the microphone. <laughs> Thank you. Well, good morning. Yeah, um, I, I want to um, just echo what Norma said. It's just really great to be on a panel. <laughs> Students, friends, interconnections are just great. And just to remind you to be sure to uh, say thank you to Margaret on your way out the door as you're leaving. I mean, she uh, has played a very important role in Christian education, and I think that we want to make sure that she gets the uh, honor that she's due. Um, so that's certainly why I'm here, and I really am glad to be here uh, to do that for you, and I hope you guys will sh share your appreciation with her as well before you leave. Let me just say a word or two about the broader context. Uh, I think um, others uh, have already said a little bit about the history of Christian education, but I think it's important to to try to locate what's going on in relation to changes that are taking place in the American context today. A uh, couple things to point to. First of all, um, 
A lot of people are questioning today the validity of the secularization thesis. And basically, uh, for most of this group, who probably went to school um, a little while ago, the secularization thesis was dominant in um, sociological explanation. And the argument basically was, as modernity developed, um, religion would become less and less important. It would be confined to the private sphere in particular. And in some of the more uh, adamant proponents of the secularization thesis that religion would kind of wither to, uh, away altogether. And we'd see the advance of scientific thinking, technological development, industrialization, so on and so forth. I would say today that um, most mainline sociologists have serious questions about whether that, in fact, uh, is the case. Uh, it's been severely uh, criticized, and that was sort of mainstream thinking throughout most of the uh, 20th century. If you look around the world, um, religion is doing very well, thank you, and it's actually being revitalized. It's played an important role in social movements like the civil rights movement in the United States and the fall of communism in Eastern Europe, and um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, the secularization thesis seems to make better sense mostly of Western European experience than any other part of the world, okay? Now, in the United States, people who are trying to think about the role of religious congregations beyond the secularization thesis are saying that uh, when you look at um, our context today, there, there are several things that you'd want to point to. For one, um, most people today uh, experience a fair amount of discomfort with uh, large-scale in institutions that are highly bureaucratic. When was the last time you tried to settle one of your insurance claims or got into an argument or um, uh, yada, yada, yada? I mean, like we can or had to go to the school to try to advocate for your child or uh, we all have those kinds of experiences. And so um, people are kind of hungry for alternates to large-scale imp impersonal uh, interaction with um, uh, bureaucratic organizations. Moreover, most people today experience pluralism uh, pretty much directly. It's not something that they just experience when they become adults and go to college, but their neighbors or their schoolmates or whatever belong to different religions or no religion at all. Uh, and young children are asking questions about that. They cel celebrate um, Hanukkah in school as well as Christmas or they, um, it's brought up, especially in curriculums that are uh, multicultural. And in this kind of context, um, many people are arguing that religion is very well situated to provide certain needs that aren't being met in any other sector of society. The need for human meaning and the need for belonging. The need for human meaning and the need for belonging. Uh, Large-scale bureaucratic institutions aren't very good at being responsive to those kinds of things, nor do they find a place for people to really find uh, a, a psychological and emotional community, uh, a community of uh, affiliation. And I think that however we think about uh, the teaching ministry and the ministry of congregations, we need to keep those sorts of things in mind. And the people who I, I think are trying to um, look at religion that's doing well in American culture and other parts of the world are arguing that one of uh, the ways that um, are those religious communities that are doing well are providing their members with what they call strong subcultural identities. Now this is a sociological way of thinking, but it means that, that the boundaries around the community are relatively clear, people have kind of a strong sense of, of uh, what they believe and the, the kind of moral values of the community. There are certain symbols. Um, it doesn't mean that people have to, be, have to um, dislike people who belong to other communities, but in their interaction with other communities, they're, they're pretty clear about this is who we are and this is what our identity is and these are the, the practices that we have. 
Now, my sense is that those of us who are in religious traditions that still want to hold on to denominational identity need to do a much better job of thinking in terms of subcultural religious identities. It's a fact that denominationalism no longer provides the major structuring of religion uh, in the United States. That's Bob Withnow, major sociologist at Princeton University, and many others have written about this. But really, after World War II, where you saw the emergence of the GI Bill, and you begin to see more and more people going, uh, you saw the expansion of higher education, basically. The income gap and the educational gap between Catholics and Protestants, between Baptists and Episcopalians, begin to go away. Uh, and so uh, denominationalism, um, which had a strong ascriptive um, impact upon religious affiliation doesn't play that role today. So it is more and more dependent upon congregations to be the focal point of the cultivation of what I'm calling sociologically subcultural religious identities. Now what does that mean? Let me, um, I'll just say a couple things real quickly and then open it up to your thoughts as well. If we're going to be focusing primarily at the congregational level on the questions of meaning and, uh, and belonging, if those are primary in terms of what we're doing, then I think that we've got to do um, a couple things uh, in a highly pluralistic um, context. First of all, we have to um, be real clear about um, the fact that uh, we're working very hard to provide people with pathways into scripture and denominational tradition. Okay. Nancy Ammerman's done some research on congregations that um, want to hold on to denominational identity. I, you know, I, I, I just said that denominationalism doesn't play the same structuring um, power uh, that it had in the past, but that doesn't mean at the congregational level that there aren't many com congregations that feel that holding on to denominational identity is very, very important to them. What Ammerman found was about 50% of the congregations that she looked at believe that they were sort of flagships for denominational identity. And so I think that if we're going to hold on to denominational identity, we've got to understand that we're kind of we're working against the stream, we're more of a minority voice, and we're going to have to do a much better job of finding pathways into scripture and tradition as that tradition articulates who we are as a part of uh, a denominational tradition. Second thing I think we need to focus on um, is sort of the core of the teaching ministry is teaching various spiritual disciplines. That in terms of belonging, uh, the folks um, aren't going to go to uh, church simply because everybody else goes to church. That is not the case anymore. They've got to find something meaningful for themselves there. And I think that um, trying to identify a core of spiritual disciplines that uh, we teach folks uh, at the heart of Christian education is going to be important. And then I think the rest of the teaching ministry, other than those two, are going to have to be um, contextually derived. And, and what I mean by that is that uh, we thought a lot in the past about Christian education along the lines of a schooling model where we have a set curriculum with a systematic and intentional course of study and you know here age related stuff you sort of move people through it and you can look at a Lutheran church over here and a Lutheran church over there and kind of the curriculum looks the same. I just don't think that's the case anymore. I think a lot of education is going to be much more context dependent. It depends on the particular population of people that you have in the church. It depends on the folks you're trying to attract to the church. It depends on the kind of mission engagement you're involved in and kind of what folks need to learn to be able to equip to do that kind of mission. So I'm, I'm saying in our context now, you've got to focus on the basics of scripture, tradition, spiritual disciplines. I think that's got to be a core of every congregation. But then pretty much the rest of it is going to have to be congregationally determined. I'll say one other thing that um, real quickly, Margaret um, mentioned uh, in passing uh, during the 70s and 80s where we had just sort of a potpourri in 
uh, uh, religious education. And part of what was, we were experiencing there was the fact that denominational identity was beginning to decline. So Tom Groom, Roman Catholic, was very influenced on Protestants. Maria Harris, Roman Catholic, very, and, and at the same time, Jim Fowler, United Methodist, was really influenced on Catholics. And so we saw this cross-fertilization in this first phase of um, moving beyond denominational identity, and, and that conversation uh, continues to be important today. But I do think the leading edge of Christian education is going to be much more particularistic and much more oriented to uh, claiming a particular theological identity and tradition and working out of that and not saying that, you know, I can necessarily uh, say what needs to be said to all kind of religious traditions that are out there, but rather I'm rooted in a particular tradition and have to speak out of that tradition. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to all of you. Uh, Craig, I guess you're going to Rome, and if someone raises their hand, ah, oh, there's uh, Linda over here, I know, raises her hand. Craig, I think Linda has her hand up. Thank you. Um, first anecdotal, and then question and challenge. Um, I'm a product of Philadelphia Seminary, but I'm also a Christian educator for over 20 years in the congregation. And with some of the demise we saw in the 90s of church-wide resources <coughs> to support Christian education and the development of leaders in our church, I've become a part of a new national organization called the Lutheran Association of Christian Educators. Burton is also a member of that group. We're regional representatives struggling to recreate models to help us train and develop congregational leaders in Christian education. And this past year, I was charged with doing a workshop in Region 7. Now, I am uh, on the territory in New Jersey Synod. I did this in New Jersey because that's where I am. I looked for other people to partner with in the leadership of this, another pastor and, and Jessica, who was our keynote speaker for a day-long event, sent out some publicity and anticipated, hoped for maybe 25 to 40 people to show up. <coughs> Two weeks before the event, I had a registration of about 25 to 28, and I thought, boy, I'm right on target. This is going to be fine. The week before the event, I got a call from my registrar at our synod office and said, you better sit down. We have over 150 people registered for this event. We ended up with 178, a pastor nervous and jerky because we exceeded fire codes in the rooms we were using. <laughs> we had to scurry around to get enough lunch. I share this because I don't think there's just a hunger. I think there's a desperation and starvation for nurturing our Christian education leaders in our congregations. We have good curriculum materials. We have a book of faith for resources, and our pastors know the content. What we do not have is a model for training lay leadership in our congregations, for nurturing and supporting not only Sunday school teachers, but adult educational leaders, and recognizing how the cultural context of our congregations has changed, that the model for leadership in white suburban Lutheran congregations is not necessarily going to work in urban, inner city, multi-ethnic congregations. Their approach to leadership is very different than ours. And I ask and I beg the academic community to start training not only the current membership in their seminaries in how to transfer and support this kind of leadership, but also to step out and come up with models for our pastors and DCEs and congregations already serving. That is where the need is. I know it can work. I've done some of it in my own congregation, but I also know that in my current synod, I am one of very few, 
And I've got more and more pastors coming to me asking, how do we do this? Thank you. That's all. Yes, hallelujah. Um, say that very loudly in the ears of Mark Staples, who is in charge of lay education here. Having been on the board at Augsburg Fortress, frankly, things run by money. I have been begging that we have better materials to equip leaders and teachers. And what I've been told is they don't want to pay a lot of money and they don't have time to read anything anyway. And so we have these itsy bitsy basic whatever they're called. They're so small that I don't see they're much use. If the Board of Publication, well not the board, but if the, if the editors believe that it will sell and sell widely, they will publish it tomorrow. Trust me. So they have to have that conviction. So please, 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 because if someone like me says that they say, well, that's what you think. But in fact, the people out there don't really want it. Hallelujah for what you said. Well, well I'm going to add my passion here. It would be too easy to simply be nostalgic and remember the 1960s when we had national Sunday school mm -hmm. teacher conventions. Mm -hmm. Or in the congregation I first served in St. Louis, a 2,000 member congregation, where each month we had teacher education for the teachers of preschool, the teachers of grade school, the teacher of junior high, the teachers of high school, and the teachers uh, of adults. Wonderful. Uh, opportunity to be able to share teaching of teachers. Jessica mentioned the equipping, equipping of the saints. Uh, for years I have been saying and challenging my students, go out and do in the parish that very thing, insist people uh, do the thing that they nobody will come to, and that is teacher education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because we cannot uh, have people teaching the faith and not be equipping them. So lace, wonderful, yes, and models. Uh, yes, uh, call for materials. Uh, Beth Lewis, if you'd email her today, everyone in this room, email Beth Lewis at Augsburg Fortress and say, we need something. She'll wonder, why'd they all come from? Oh, anyway. Um, but I will challenge us in another way. When, when Burton was in a parish in, in, uh, in Detroit, inner city, and we had the West Side Lutheran Parish, those five congregations who joined together for not only for survival and support in the city, we had joint teacher education, those five congregations. The conference is an underutilized uh, expression of the church. We do a lot with synods, we do a lot with congregations, but the conference is the neighborhood. Uh, again, I'll quote Burton here, who's, who's worked with conferences and had teacher education appreciation a meal in which all the teachers of, of those congregations, 20 or so congregations and conference come together and they have a speaker and a banquet and say thank you, and workshops, you know? Uh, or the neighborhood ecumenically. I challenge everyone in this room to go home and do that thing that seems foolish to do. Because 150, 175 people just might come, or even if they don't start anyway, we cannot do any less because the, the, the nuances of the faith, uh, the theological, biblical, uh, catechetical uh, nuances, we need to have that uh, clear and forthright, and we need to be equipped with methods. Uh, and people do have time to come to something for which they're challenged to use their gifts. They'll show up for learning how to coach little league soccer, right? Okay, I challenge us to do that, to have churches uh, which with doors wide open that are equipping, equipping everyone in the congregation. Um, of course, no, well, maybe, maybe some people will come. I also just want to say quickly that one of the joys of teacher training is that they are joy-filled. And I think uh, in the workshop yesterday, one of the things I wanted to convey is that <coughs> when we talk with one another, we actually enjoy each other. Yeah. 
you know, and I think you shared that yesterday, that, that, you know, people actually spontaneously laugh when they actually communicate with one another, and that can be fun. So one of the byproducts of teacher training or any training that we do is that you are actually being about ministry in facilitating relationships among people who generally don't have time to talk with one another. And so not only are you encouraging their competencies by feeling like they are equipped, but you're also encouraging their relationships with one another and their care for one another. Oh, I have this idea about in my Sunday school class, and oh, that's a great idea. Why didn't I think about that? Well, you're offering that space and that time in the midst of training to facilitate relationships. And that's what people are craving, is that ability and that space. Well, what a wonderful byproduct to have training, but the initial response is actually facilitating relationship and the meaning making and the belonging that we want to establish as congregations. Um, yeah, I always, um, thinking about leadership um, in congregations and how to support it, I've always had this tension in my own mind between movements and institutions, and I think a lot of leadership education is oriented towards recruiting people to fulfill certain roles within the institution as it currently exists. And that really, if you think, uh, which you need. I mean, you know, you don't have organizations that don't, aren't institutionalized in certain ways. But movements have to do more of a sense, to me, are kind of what we need to push our churches toward. So part of when, when you think about leadership, you think about um, Robert Quinn's written a really great book called Deep Change, for example, and that are transforming leadership. There's a lot of people who are trying to talk about organizational change. and. To me, when you, um, when you begin uh, to think about how you actually change an organization like a congregation, it be, to become more movement-like, to kind of discern anew what its missional vocation is in this particular time and place, and to engage people in that, uh, then the, the leadership kind of uh, emerges as you go along. It's sort of like the, 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 the excitement and, and generates uh, um, the interest and new leaders emerge and they have the gifts and you, you have to equip them for those gifts. But it feels less like you're filling slots that are already pre-existent and much more like you're uh, getting out of the way of the Holy Spirit as these people kind of are beginning to be attracted to a movement. And a lot of times, actually, the long-term leaders of congregations are the people most resistant to change. Uh, so it's, um, it sets up a different dynamic uh, there for you. How do you, how do you deal with conflict and how do you kind of um, get the laggard, so to speak, on board uh, in, in dealing with that? So that's just another way of thinking about kind of um, the, the education and, and nurture of leader, leadership. It's more like, well, where's our congregation going? And how do we claim our missional identity? And how are we more movement-like in um, making that happen and less oriented towards recruiting folks to fill a slots in an institution? I usually try to keep quiet when Norma's presenting, but um, I'd like to speak to the uh, congregational identity and the identity with a larger church. The interim that I'm currently serving is a young mission. It's been heavily supported to the point where they were not paying anything for the pastor's salary or benefits at all. And uh, there were some folks who kept thinking that Synod should be giving more and more. What I discovered was they didn't know anything about the work of the larger church. They didn't know, with one exception, where we take a hunger um, offering during the children's sermon out of pocket. They were doing nothing in relationship to the ministry of the larger church. They didn't know about Lutheran services. Uh, they didn't know that uh, Lutheran disaster ministry is the last to leave in disaster situations. So I've begun to work at a concept that I learned from some congregations celebrating the 150th anniversary, where each month we highlight a ministry of the larger church. 
and invite members to participate in. I think that's part of meaning making. Uh, people have a sense of meaning if they see the work of the larger church. So I think that a part of the process means an involvement where the action reflection model takes place and people are drawn into the work of the larger church and then return and sustain the ministry of the congregation. Um, thank you for being here and for sharing your uh, thoughts and wisdom and ideas with us on these days. Um, I have a question related to the uh, forming of subcultural identities. Um, I've often described the congregation I serve in a rural non-farming uh, area in New Jersey um, as being a, a niche church. Um, we're in one of the wealthiest counties in the country, um, very conservative, very Republican, and Bishop Riley in New Jersey describes us as a bunch of flaming liberals. Uh, we are very active in advocacy um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. with uh, a regional equity coalition and activities like that. Um, and, and I think we do a lot of good things in those ways. And, and that's very much in Hunterdon County a subcultural identity. But ask folks to come to worship regularly. Well, pastor, you used to be Roman Catholic. Don't make us feel guilty. You know how bad that is. Um, you know, ask them to come to a Bible study. They'll, they'll come study an ELCA uh, social statement in a, in a flash. But if I do a Bible study, two people. <laughs> you know, it, it's... It's a struggle. Where's, where's the balance um, between that subcultural identity and celebrating that and doing the gospel in the world and that equipping stuff that you're all talking about? We've got two questions on the table, and I'll just respond to that last one and then turn the mic over for... Um, to one of the rest of you. I mean, that's a, it's a, it's a big issue. What what you're saying because liberal congregations uh, tend to be pretty individualistic, uh, sociologically speaking. And um, right now, one of my own research interests um, is trying to look at exactly the question that you're talking about. How do you, um, how do you actually cultivate subcultural identities that aren't closed and don't create folks who just think alike? but actually engage the world around them and are equipped to do that. I mean, the big issue, the problem is that many mainline congregations are so loosely bounded that they really don't generate enough, enough uh, cultural capital to shape the identity of the people that they're in. And you, you need to shape that, equip them to engage the institutions of modernity that are so powerful. Uh, the media is in our bedroom, it's in our living room. I mean, it's all over the place. And unless we uh, can cultivate an identity that kind of uh, helps us to engage that with an alternate story and an alternate set of values and an alternate vision, then that's just gonna be inside our, our head and, and shape our consumption patterns and all that kind of stuff. So I mean, I think what you're saying, you're, you're asking is the right question. A lot of subcultural identity theory has focused on conservative Protestantism and immigrant communities, okay? And the question that I'm beginning to explore empirically is, um, well, what about liberal congregations? And I'm actually beginning to look at congregations, and I probably want to get your name and go look at your Kurtz or something like that. I mean, can liberal congregations really generate subcultural identities? Or is the individualism so strong that they can agree around social ethical issues, but in terms of the kind of meaning and belonging being shaped by kind of core religious beliefs and practices. Is there something there? I don't know the answer to that at that point, but I think that's the right question to be asking. 
Let me res yeah. Yeah, thank you. I'll respond not as he did, but just a slightly um, a different addition here. Um, I visit congregations all over the congre all over the country. I just love to. I just there's kind of a little Charles Corral in me that goes out on the road. And um, he, she mentioned the books, "Open the Doors and See All the People," which is a storybook of congregations I visited all over the country. Um, so, what do you find when you see when you go? I'm utterly surprised every time. And we yes, we can research and uh, do ethnographic research on a congregation, if you will. Um, and yet, I'm utterly surprised every time, and that's wonderful. Uh, but so many congregations will say, um, well, I'll, I'll tell you a story. Years ago, actually, when I was in, in uh, Connecticut and went to do parish uh, fill-in preaching on a Sunday morning at a congregation down the turnpike, and I arrived about 45 minutes early, and usher left, let me in, and I said who I was, and he says, good morning, we're not the church we used to be. <laughs> So I said, well then, who are you? <laughs> who are you? Um, I, uh, yes. Um, so beginning where they are in this learning community, the ministry in which they're engaged, sometimes the ministry in which congregations are engaged in spite of themselves. Mm -hmm. Just say, what, what are you doing here? Gossip about each other. And oh, oh, I'll see somebody over here doing all kinds of ministry, and this group meets on Tuesday afternoon, and, and, but they're involved with so-and-so. Yeah, I won't come to a Bible study, but walking with them in their ministry, and then what are the issues you have here? So again, this idea of starting in different directions, you know, with who they are, even if they, and helping them name that. And I'll ask them, what's the image you have of the church? Paul Meniere's <laughs> work, you know, of all these uh, hundred images of the church in the New Testament. Uh, and and th th they'll be able to think in image language. One said, I'm, we're a sleeping giant. Mm -hmm or whatever image, and helping them claim the identity they have and then grow into learning to be in relationship to the scripture and theology whom God is calling them to be in mission. But starting where they are, they are so resistant to what they perceive as institutional um, program at us. Mm -hmm. And an anti-institutionalism uh, that well, let me come at it another way around. Uh, as, as Rick said, the, the, the predictions that religion wouldn't mean anything, right, in the end of the 20th century. And certainly right now we have all sorts of books and studies on the death of denominations. Well, here Burton says, just telling them the stories of what their church body is doing. Maybe the affiliation beyond their own identity is more important to them than we've, you know, we kind of given up on. So this idea of believing the church, not believing in the church, but believing the church. It is the good news, it is the body of Christ. And starting with getting to know this little group, on Lutherans are always one street off Main Street or something, you know? And, and finding out who they are and then connecting with one another. It's a, I feel like sometimes I'm a, uh, an epistle reader <laughs> as I move from congregation to congregation and um, encourage them to be whom God is creating them and growing them to be. Yeah. I think you sound as if you have a wonderful opportunity there. My guess is that they are not, there are people differ in the ways they like to go about learning. There are some people who really honestly like to study the scriptures for the sake of studying the scriptures. I hear you saying, no, that's not our group, but they love to study ethical issues or social issues. Oh, hallelujah, they're not going to be able to do ethical or social issues without having solid scriptural and theological studies. So just advertise it to be whatever it is that they really are engaged in, and when they come along, hello, part of it is going to grasp the tradition. Uh, you know, if they resist that, then you've, you've got a different issue. But... Uh, but it's probable that if they hear, oh, we're going to study the book of Isaiah, well, oh, hello, I'm not interested in Isaiah, don't think I'll go. Um, ah, yeah, you, you, can, you don't always have to advertise the Bible or start with the Bible to end up with solid scriptural and theological and historical and everything else studies, <coughs> um, which they then can perceive as, as integral to what they apparently have a passion for. That's wonderful. Here, here. 
<laughs> Thanks, Greg. Uh, it was interesting to hear the statistics on Sunday schools and vacation Bible school. Um, I think we can teach as much in a week, 15 hours of vacation Bible school as we can cover in a year of uh, our programs in which people come late and leave early, uh, teachers that have to get in the choir, things like that. One of the uh, most underutilized resources and one of the great joys of Lutherans and Episcopal churches today is the global mission event. Yeah. And I continue to go in front of groups and ask how many people have ever gone and see a hand, two hands in the room. And I'm not going to ask that here. Um, we're signing up for our, our 15th go round. I learned more in continuing education uh, in Thursday night, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday afternoon in some far off location. Uh, just getting out of town is helpful, but uh, I know you mentioned uh, Leslie Newbegin and John Douglas Hall, and that was 10 years ago and 15 years ago at, at Global Mission Events they came, and then when they were done, you could engage them for hours um, in conversation. And so we have missional church front leaders from every, every strain uh, coming from our own denomination, coming back from foreign lands, from our cities and from our rural areas doing cutting edge ministry, all getting together in this wonderful cauldron. And uh, I encourage a few members of my church each year to go. And we have, um, I think about 30 now who have attended and become the missional church which is why we have an African mission in the middle of farmland 20 miles north of here. But um, it is uh, incremental and uh, very beneficial. And I encourage all of you to go. Cheap date, $240 for three days. And this year, we get to go to La Crosse, Wisconsin, which also has some pretty good breweries. So, I mean, win-win. <laughs> let, let me just share that I was, oh, my goodness, my mom could perhaps share with me. I think I was 12 years old at the GME listening to Douglas John Hall um, years ago and feeling and the amazing energy and incredible educational opportunities for children because it's a family event in which the children are encouraged to come. And so we went as an entire family and, um, and, and to two of them. And it was a formative experience in my mind, um, listening at a young age to Douglas John Hall um, up on that stage. Um, so I do encourage those type of events and to consider that what you said, which is the smaller intense period of times as well from formational experience, whether it's camping ministries or the National Lutheran Youth Gathering or the adult opportunities that we have across our country. I mean, folks, in many cases, not all, of course, um, being an, uh, an urban ministry concentration person, I'm all too aware of this, but folks can fly to conferences sponsored by denominations. Um, and so when there are opportunities for leadership training that are put on by the ELCA, you may encourage congregations to go or raise enough money to send a leader and make it a formative event within your congregation. Um, to equip that leader um, for ministry by sending them off in a public way within your congregation. And then to, to caution us not to always emphasize the big pivotal events, but that we must have ongoing opportunities and touchdown points that are continu uh, continuous throughout the year within our congregations and continuous throughout the year, the whole year. Yeah. Many of our adults do not take summer vacation. Mm -hmm. So there is lots of opportunity for whole year learning. The events don't have to end in May. Mm. Events, you know, our programming doesn't have to end, you know, and, and take a break <coughs> over the summer. It can be the whole year, and there are many opportunities for that, and I encourage you to consider that as well. First of all, thanks to everyone, especially to Margaret. My only regret is you're too young that you weren't at seminary when I was here. <laughs> uh, I heard with great interest you talking about word and witness. Yeah. And I have to say that uh, I did the word and witness study, uh, you know, John Ruman and 
uh, Foster McCurley were teachers of mine here. And a week after I got my doctorate at Princeton, I went for two weeks of word and witness study, less than motivated. <laughs> it was great. It was transforming for our congregation, transforming, absolutely. Taught it through six times now. Part of that whole, I think, legacy of word and witness, for us at least, was the diaconia program. Mm -hmm. And I've had 20 graduates of Diaconia, 15 of whom are currently active in our congregation. Mm -hmm. uh, but I really trace that back to word and witness. So I guess there's two questions to ask. One is, do you think anything even like another word and witness experience is possible, just given the different tenor of the times? And you know, in what ways do you think that would change? And the other is, uh, my high expectation people are saying one of the deficits they're seeing in the Lutheran Church is really there's not enough continuing opportunities for these high expectation folks who want to get really in-depth type of situation. And you know, what opportunities are coming up? Let, let me just say uh, a couple of things. The Book of Faith open the scriptures, join the conversation. Some people have thought it might be a word and witness, something that you know, you've got in your hand and can teach. And it really is a join the conversation. So there's opportunity for what you may be doing in your congregation, or what we just talked about with your congregation, putting that experience, a story of that, or resources from that up on the web, and you sharing you know, what you had. Uh, that's how people like to learn in kind of web learning today. But that means moving beyond a dependency to really an interdependency of sharing methods of opening the scripture together. Uh, if people kind of sit and wait for something that will be, it, it ain't going to come. Mm -hmm. Now there will be a, a, a Lutheran study Bible and then there's a book that is just out uh, and it will be at your Synod Assembly. You can get it free from the Augsburg Fortress booth. And in the back, um, something that we professors at our Lutheran seminaries worked on together, and that is a resource for where shall we begin with individuals and congregations of, of stories. of They sit around and tell stories of you know, when they heard the Bible, when they first went to a global mission event or whatever. And then where are we now? And then what do we need and what do we envision? Uh, so there are ways to, uh, to embrace that. But it, it won't just be a one-time thing, but lots of sharing of ideas. Uh, Margaret also mentioned connections, and it was so exciting to be part of using Luther's large catechism mm -hmm. together with visits to people's daily lives. And I, actually, I've talked to Beth Lewis about that, and she, she didn't even know about it. You know, I mean, these resources kind of come and go, but the idea of using... Uh, catech catechesis with adults, uh, there are, but you're right, Margaret, how people call for that, how people call for that and share ideas with one another. Yeah, I think the Book of Faith initiative can be a great opportunity for in-depth, serious uh, biblical engagement. And it will, they are planning to train how many thousand lay people? 5,000 pastors and 15,000 lay people, I think. Uh, to be the leaders of it in the local congregation. So sign your people up that you think would, would have the, or they feel that they are called to have the gifts to, to do this. Uh, it, we haven't heard a whole lot at this point, but within this year, you will hear huge amounts about it. The other question you had about in-depth opportunities. <clears throat> I, uh, I liked what, uh, what Jessica was mentioning about the possibility of of ongoing um, throughout the year opportunities. One thing I didn't mention earlier is, is serious uh, teacher preparation courses that actually require a commitment of people to do a certain amount of theology and Bible and teaching methods and developmental theory and, mm -hmm. and uh, whatever else. But they promise that they will come and they do it and they do homework and they read books and they discuss the books and it's, it's not surface stuff at all. And I've had the joy of teaching that in local congregations every year pretty well, I think, for the last oh, my 30 years. So, so you can design your own programs and decide what you will do. And if you make it challenging enough and say, not everybody 
can do this. Only those whom a certain committee has felt that the spirit is calling and who will have the dedication. All of a sudden it becomes very important yes. and you've got a whole line of people signing up saying, please consider me. Uh, sin forever can work in our favor. So, so you, know, you, you can do a lot of in-depth stuff. Um, I find that most, most congregations have some people who want really, really serious. They would love to be at seminary if they could and they can't and they don't have time, but they really would like that kind of thing. And that is why you folks who've been to seminary are called to share every single thing that you've ever learned with your congregation. Then there's a whole lot of people that are not at that level and say, well, I thought I want some serious study, but I really don't want to read anything outside, or I don't want to think about it outside. I'll just come for the classes. And then there are some people who just say, I would like just things that I can sit back and, and watch some videos, or hear some nice speakers, or whatever, but I don't have to do much myself. And, and we've just got to cater for all of those persons, because learning can be done at different levels, and that's not evil. Uh, the spirit can move in many ways. It just takes some ingenuity and some willingness on the part of whoever in your congregation really supports uh, education to get together and say, how can we do this? And to have a whole lot of persons trained to be able to help you because there's no way one person or two people or three people are ever going to be able to do that for a congregation. I hear. Uh, real challenges for the church that is responding to educational research that's happened in the last 10 or 15 years. And that's with Howard Gardner's work from, up in Harvard on multiple intelligences and recognizing that people learn and teach in many different ways. It's not good, better, or worse, it's just different. It's that we can be together but be different. Um, model that Norma talked about. And I think this is part of the challenge in our congregations is identifying and inviting people to explore the role of leadership and deepening their faith through scripture study and theological conversation and recognizing that you're going to have to have groups that approach this in different ways. You may have people that are really into in-depth scripture study. They love to read. They love to study. And then you're going to have people that have an attention span of about three and a half minutes but can respond to excellent video and DVD work and still engage in theological conversation and scripture study. And then you're going to have people that only can come once a year to a weekend retreat, but it can be deeply enriching to them, just like a spa treatment, and nurture their faith through a whole year. And you're going to have to have a variety of ways of doing this. Um, now you get my 45 second plug for LACE which is an evolving organization um, wrestling with trying to provide a variety of resources and ways to nurture educational leaders. We've got some print material in the, way, in the means of a quarterly newsletter that gets mailed. We're developing a new website that's going to have multi-layers of resources. We've got web-based dialogues and conversations to share resources and teaching models and we're developing in face-to-face -face conferences to help teach and train leaders. If you're interested in joining, I've got a notepad that will take addresses. I promise to get you information um, mailed if that's your way of learning. But if you are a webinar or an internet um, junkie, go to lace.org. Org is important. If you just Google LACE, you're going to get some very strange things showing up on your computer. <laughs> or type in Lutheran Association of Christian Educators, and, and you'll get there and you'll start to get some information. Burton or I would be happy to have conversation with people about this. But this is, uh, we're also looking to partner with Augsburg, with our church-wide organization, and with our seminaries. And we have direct connections with several of our seminaries currently at Luther and at Trinity and I'm looking to strengthen that with conversation I've already had with Mark Staples through lifelong learning uh, but I know Mark is leaving the end of June yeah. and so I'm hoping that we'll continue the conversation in this area about that 
Uh, but I think the invitation and the identification of potential growth in your congregations is really important. Um, some of my own experience has been that I advertise a program, a Bible study, an activity, but then I do face-to-face -face intentional invitation or I do intentional mailings to a subgroup in the congregation to attend this event, and it's working. Um, in response to Al's question, uh, the Kelly Fryer Bible study materials that were developed at Augsburg Fortress about five years ago is a wonderful way to engage new Christians or young, immature Christians in Bible study. I did three sessions, they're each six sessions, opened it up to the congregation, but intentionally invited every new member who joined in the last three years. I had six to seven people show up each week for about three months. Four years later, every single person that participated is in a leadership role in this congregation, either with their own small group, a council member, or teaching Sunday school. It can work, but it doesn't happen overnight, and it's got to be ongoing. It's not going to happen after two or three Bible study sessions. But there are some things out there you're just going to have to go searching for. Last words? We're about the end. Just thank you all for coming, and, and I hope, I pray, that this time together will have stimulated you and blessed you so that you will return and really have wonderful education and missional education experiences in your congregations. Keep the faith. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to get discouraged week after week, year after year. Things don't always work out the way you'd planned. And, oh, well. Uh, keep at it. Keep on keeping on. Mm -hmm. and, and that will be a great blessing to the church. Yeah. Margaret, I just thank you for keeping the faith. I want to just give one more round.